All right, guys, welcome back. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. We're back with Brian Weissman. Hey, Brian. Hello again. All right, guys, so we are running into like hours of footage. <laughs> we actually went in and got some sushi, um, and uh, we're back and finishing up this deck tech. So we're going to uh, finish off with the blues. Uh, from the last video, you'll notice that we actually kind of stopped at the blues, and then we're going to go through and talk about some of the lands and then we'll have another video separately for the sideboard. All right, so Brian promises not to tell uh, too many stories in this one. It's hard for me, but I'll try. It's all straight business in this one. Yeah, totally. By the book. All right, so let's go with the blues. Uh, Brian, you were mentioning so, uh, the... Okay, yeah. So you've got uh, the obligatory Time Walk and Ancestor Recall, which, of course, are pretty much mandatory in every single deck, Ancestor Recall being the most powerful card ever printed in all of Magic. Really? Oh, yeah, easily. People... People rave about Black Lotus and so on, but I take Ancestral over Black Lotus in my opening hand any day, especially in a control deck like this. The Lotus is good, but Ancestral is the most consistently powerful card, and it's certainly the number one tutor target. What do you think, Time Walk or Time Twister is better? Time Walk is way better. Okay. Time Twister's effect can be replicated by a lot of things, whereas Time Walk, you, you don't get that effect in anything for that compact cost. You have to pay five for a Time Walk now, so unless you're cheating with a Mana Vault. I'm sorry, with a Time Vault. And uh, Recall is super powerful. You don't see this in every single list, but I think it's, again, a mandatory card that is often overlooked. In fact, back in the day, we said that there were five blue power cards, not three. Most people regard these three as the blue power cards, but Brain Geyser and Recall win just as many games, just about, if not more, than uh, especially these two. And Time Walk, unfortunately, as powerful as, as it is, is often just sort of a glorified cantrip, or almost like an explore, a blue explore, in that you just draw an extra card in play an extra land. It doesn't do a lot more than that unless the timing is set up for it, although it can do crazy insane things because it doubles your mana later in the game, allowing you to cast a time walk, play a bunch of stuff, and fight a permission war that turn, and then untap and do what you really intended to do once their resources are exhausted. And then the only card in here that's really not an auto-include is Time Twister, and this is a card that I'm on the fence about as far as including in the main deck. Hmm. And I've, I've decided to go with it. I think that it's probably, it's just one of those fallback plan cards it's nice to have access to it in your deck because sometimes you get mind twisted and you lose the shriven dragon and you lose regrowth there's no yogmoss will in this format yet it hasn't been invented for another four or five years and having this as a sort of fail safe against things that go really really wrong like getting your hand hit by a specter multiple times just knowing that you've got it in your deck as a way out can sometimes make the difference between winning and losing the game that said there are plenty of matches where i sideboard this card out because i don't intend to be behind Right. I intend to have a, uh, I intend to, to have an advantage either in hand or on the board or ideally both. Although the one thing the Time Twister is really good for in the main deck is that if you're able to trade resources in hand for resources in play, exampling disenchanting everything they put into play artifact wise, all their moxes and counters even counterspelling moxes, knowing that you have a time twister sitting in your hand means that you are able to time twist with a three or four card permanent advantage. And that really locks in that advantage before they're able to come back with all the extra cards that they have in their hand because you were uh, spending yours on stuff like Moxes. What about Wheel of Fortune? Uh, Wheel of Fortune doesn't belong in this deck. Um, hmm. It just, again, it's because you don't intend to be... The card is never going to be good when you're ahead. You're never going to want to play it when you're ahead. And you, uh, the times when you're behind and that it's really advantageous, it's cards that only work when you're behind aren't really the kind of cards you want main deck in a control deck. Wheel is some, a card you could consider for the sideboard against a, a really dedicated discard strategy, but balance is going to be a way better card to use in that case, especially against land destruction. And uh, balance is a card that I sideboarded most of the time, although I'm not using it now because no one's playing land destruction, at least not dedicated land destruction. Hmm. And it doesn't really work very well against uh, aggro heavy strategies because you sure you balance away their creatures in play, but their deck's really homogenous. They've got two factories out there and it reduces your hand size by a lot. So you can't always rely on balance to do stuff. Plus, I'm using Ivory Tower to fight aggro, and uh, because it's not restricted, and balance, of course, is uh, doesn't really have a lot of synergy with Ivory Tower. So um, that is all the spells. I could go on for ages about these, <laughs> but in lieu of, of course. In interest of time, I'm going to just talk about the mana sources. All right, let's take a so, look. If you count this, this is 31 non-mana producing cards, which means that the deck, my version of it, is running 29. 31, guys. Check it out. Pause it right here. Yeah. Yep. That's perfect. Yeah. Seems crazy, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So you pause no, 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 no. I'm telling the people watching pausing. Oh, pausing. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're no, like, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, and it seems crazy, right, to run a deck with 29 mana sources. That's almost 50% yeah, mana. Yeah, yeah. But because of the way that these games play out, right. the guy who loses, especially in a control and control match, is often the guy who misses one or two land drops. Right. Being able to just play lands for the first eight or ten turns of the game is often all you want to be doing. This is just quintessential draw go. And it was even more important back in the mana drain era when it was too dangerous to sort of blink first and cast something. Mm -hmm. That would often result in you losing the game because the guy would have two mana drains in his hand. You'd fight a permission war over the mana drains and then he'd wind up untapping and mind twisting you or something. Uh, but that said, it's still hugely advantageous to be able to just play lands forever. So... Along the lines of the things that cost nothing. All the power nine, all the colors. Yeah, this is, of course, a no-brainer inclusion for a five-color control deck. Now, this the Lotus and the power, did you win that in the ante? None of these cards. These were all acquired in trade. Okay. Years and years and years ago. That'd just be sick. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I never played for Black Lotus ante. I did not have balls okay. that big. Not even close. Keep in mind that that when I played for things like Beta Duel Lands for Anti, they were only worth ten dollars. So people did Anti Black Lotus. Absolutely, yeah. I know Holy people who won and lost dozens of lotuses. Over wow, their wow. They, they were the high rollers. They're the kind of people that would play money draft matches for a hundred bucks later on at Pro Tours and stuff. They were just gamblers by. It. And I'm not, I'm not uh, a gambler really. I'm, I'm only going to wager something that's valuable when I feel I have a substantial edge. I don't want right. to. I don't want to be gambling. Certainly not when my livelihood is depending on it. Nice cards or a tool. They were my livelihood, so... What we can do with um, the land, you can put it over here if you want, if, that, if that's comfortable. Oh, just set it over there? Yeah, because yeah, then I can... Runs. At least the whole deck is... No, you can... The whole deck is kind of... Yeah. Uh, you, re you recommend just laying them out here? Yeah, just put it right here and... Okay, yeah, sure. It's, it's casual. Right, so... The land's pretty boring, but we'll just go through it. Like, so it's just, all stacked just, up and triggering me again. And, of course, the seventh power artifact card is the Soul Ring. Which, depending on the situation, can be better or worse than a Mox. Sometimes it's more powerful than Black Lotus. And if you've played much Commander, you recognize this card is the strongest, second strongest card in the entire format, behind its zero casting cost compatriot, the Mana Crypt. Which is artificially strong in Commander because you have way more life to work with. It took a long time before people started playing Mana Crypt in Type 1. Yeah, definitely. Like a long, long time. There was a weird time, though, when there was a rule... A global rule that said when an artifact was tapped, it shut off its ability. So you could play with four mana crypts, and as long as you tap the mana crypts during your upkeep that fuel something like a Jam Day Tome or a Disrupting Scepter, yeah, I guess you can Scepter because it, it's not at sorcery speed, it's just during your turn, I think. Um, you could fuel and activate Jade Statues or Mishra's Factories. You could, you could use the mana crypt during your upkeep, and that prevented you from having to flip a coin for it, so it had no draw. Wow. It was pretty gross. Wow, yeah, nice. Really well. I had a deck built around that. Um, okay, so moving on to the land. The only dual land that I'm currently playing with four of is Tundra. Hmm. Well, these of course, the, all the white. These, these are the famous four Tundras. Wow. Courtesy of Les Douglas from our, our anti-match <laughs> anti -match over 20 years ago. So guys, if you the the the, set, the main deck video, the first video, or, or, or actually maybe the first video where Brian rants about uh, some of the things he's done, he anteed... Uh, to uh, uh, a revised fork to win these four beta tundras. Unbelievable. Unfortunately for him, they're all fake. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> it. Damn it, Les. In the head. All right. And of course, I'm running four tundras because the core of the deck, even though it's no longer running Sarah Angels, the core of the deck's defense is Disenchanted Swords to Plowshares. So you need the maximum amount of white sources that don't hurt you in order to do that. And Good old volcanic. later versions, I actually own four beta volcanic islands because I played with four in my type one deck for years. Uh, that was starting in the Gorilla Shaman era. Once Alliances was printed, Gorilla Shaman was clearly a, an auto include, and I ran two of them for years. In fact, I would just win most of my games with Gorilla Shamans. So uh, between that and the Red Elemental, that's Blast, the Mox Monkey. Yeah, the Mox Monkey, exactly. Guys, Mox Monkey, Gorilla Shaman, Alliances. Uh, and Alliances, yeah. yes. Look at that card, nasty. So good. Nasty, so, so good. good. And it, the, the amount of people that would actually die to Gorilla Shaman damage over seven or eight turns of just getting yeah. hit by one or two Gorilla Shamans. You win most of your games that way, actually. Was it one drop? Yeah, one drop. And, and then they tap to destroy it's a. One XX yeah. to destroy an artifact with converted mana plus yeah. X, so Mox is just one mana. Nasty. Yeah, super Absolutely. good. Um, but I'm running three Volcanic Islands, and here I have four main deck red cards and a super late 
red cards, so uh, there isn't an imperative to run more than that. The sideboard does contain a fair amount of red cards, and it may be wrong to actually run this many volcanics, or only run uh, three volcanics because of my dependence on red in the sideboard. The one issue with that, though, is that I have Blood Moon in the sideboard, and of course, if I resolve the Blood Moon, I have all the red I need, so it's not really that big of a deal. And the Volcanic Islands, of course, can sh fuel a, uh, a fast kill with a Shivan Dragon. I only have a couple copies of Underground Sea, and it's it's been amusing to me that I actually had to acquire two more of these more recently to, to fill out the collection of four. Because back in the day, there really wasn't a huge reason to have black mana in your control deck. In fact, it only fed two cards. This is before Yawgmoss Will existed. I never used the Abyss. And um, hmm. this was before Vampiric Tutor existed. So there was really only Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist to run off black. And because of that, you just didn't really need black mana. And it's kind of funny, too, because in, in modern... In contemporary magic, people view Underground Sea as by far the most valuable dual land in the game. But for a long time, they weren't at all. Tundra was the most valuable duel. Right. Everybody wanted Tundras, because the control decks needed four Tundras, and you hardly play with any Underground Seas at all. So it took a long time for Underground Sea to become the king. Of course, blue and black are the best colors in magic. Any, you know, anybody who, who studies or understands the game knows that. So Underground Sea is rightfully the most valuable now. Keeping with colored mana... And continuing on, I have three copies of City of Brass. Good old city. Good old city. These are Arabian Night cities. And I've gone back and forth between playing three and four versions of this card. And currently I'm running three of them. And this is a little bit in response, too, to the fact that the format is a little bit more damage-heavy than it used to be. There's a lot more aggression, especially in the form of Mishra's Factories and Serenity of Freets. But the cities can really... They can become a, a huge pain in the ass. Plus, they're a lot less useful now that you can't kill people with Mirror Universe. Mm. So the damage actually does matter a lot more than it used to when it was all just control decks fighting against each other. And you could take 15 points of city damage and it wouldn't affect the outcome of the game at all. Now it can be a, a bigger liability. A lot more people are running lightning bolts and burn spells and stuff. So I'm running three cities, and so far that's worked just fine. Um, and then, to support the Blood Moon plan, hmm. five basic land. Wow, five basic land, everybody. Yeah. And I noticed in Jeff's deck, he had seven. And I think I had published versions of the deck that actually ran seven seven basic lands, three planes and, and four islands. But truthfully, that was a, that was a big mistake because uh, even with two Sarahs and two Moats, three planes is just too much, too much base white mana. They're just so bad most of the time in terms of their interaction. You needed, back then, hmm. you needed to have blue sources, just an overload of blue sources because it was all about just position, building position. See, some people would managers. some people would be like, well, why don't you just do four underground seas, uh, four volcanics, and who cares about the main deck? Yeah, well, But, but you're, you're positioning Blood Moon main deck. Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a valid argument for going either all in on the Blood Moon strategy or all but ignoring it. Hmm. And I think that going halfway is dumb. I think that putting one basic planes and one island into your deck or something... Hmm. To try to counteract Blood Moon is just pointless because it's those two, those are not gonna, especially against decks with multiple strip lines, those aren't going to matter often enough against Blood Moon. You're not going to have them often enough to really reliably be able to deal with Blood Moon if it comes out. And they're going to come up frequently enough to screw over your mana base when you need red and you draw another basic island. Yeah, I think this I think this is a good choice for the four strip mines, definitely. Yeah, um, a strategy is, versus the, the Swedish rules. Of course. And yeah. and I'll get to the strip mines because they're by far the most sort of impactful and sure. important part of the deck. Um this stupid card. <laughs> and this is I, not power if, ten right yeah, here. Yeah, if I if I ever wind up going out to Sweden to play in their tournament, I will do everything I can to argue vociferously about Library of Alexandria. And I think that there's honestly two ways that old school format can be played healthily. I think that the best way in the format that I prefer the most is this, balance. Oh. Library of Alexandria legal, strip mine unrestricted as a four of. I think that this is by far the best way to play the format. All right. For, uh, for a lot of reasons, and I can I can go on a long tirade about strip mine, but... Um, well, I know what's going to happen, guys. Okay, so there's two kinds of viewers here. There's people that are the Swedish players who are literally going to say, oh, four strip mines. No, that's not Swedish legal, right? Yeah, how And then there's the Eternal Central players. Oh, that's cool. So, Brian, you have a few moments here. Tell us the brief tirade. Why do you feel that four strip mines is the effective route? All right, well, I was... I was and this is the last lance, right? Yeah. This this was, was, this oh, there's no factories. 
Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody, are you listening to this? There's no Mishra's Factory. Every every version of the deck that yeah, I've seen no has factories. Mishra's Factory. No way. Okay, there's go ahead. There's a bunch yeah. of reasons behind that. But yes. um, first of all, as far as the most important card in this entire deck, and especially with Mana Drain being gone, is this one. These four guys. Strip Mines are serve not only as the, yeah, the key disruption tool in the deck, or any really devoted control deck. They are one of the most important skill testing cards that the format has as well. And they get, there's a stigma about them because a lot of people, everybody can recall games where they started the game with two or three land, mm -hmm. and their opponent has just strip mined the first two lands that they played, and they never interacted after that and lost, and felt like they couldn't do anything. And then they call it luck. And they say, oh, it's luck and this card's degenerate and it's stupid and it ruins the game. <laughs> right. But the truth of the matter is, is that those games are an aberration. Look at how many lands are in the deck. The deck has 20, it has 22 land in it and seven mana producing artifacts. It is a huge amount of land. And so the games where you only draw two or three land and, and draw no land after that are extremely rare. You're going to draw land, and the thing is, because of the way the format is, it's very hard for your opponent. Almost all the defense costs one and two mana, so it's very hard for your opponent to really put you away, even if you're crippled on mana at the beginning. Because of that, if you do get strip mined earlier, that comes at a big cost to your opponent's mana development, too. And unless he's able to couple the strip mines with a bunch of moxes and an artifact that cements his card advantage, he can't really roll that early disruption into a victory. It'll just be annoying, but it won't result in him actually winning the game. However, if strip mines are coupled with a deliberate containment and mana destruction strategy that comes at the hands of Disenchant, the counter magic, and the recursion in the deck, including Recall and Regrowth and Chaos Orb, all those things combined are sort of an interlocking web that can prevent your opponent from ever actively engaging in the game for a long period of time. But that is a that's a quintessential strategy of the deck. That's not a random fluke thing that happens every 20 games that makes the guy feel bad. This is something that occurs nearly every single game when you direct your play in that, in that direction. So for example, I played against a friend of mine in New Zealand recently. We played 12 games of old school over two days. And in those games, he won one of the 12. And we were playing nearly identical mirror match copies of this deck. I think they were different by three or four cards, but they were almost exactly the same. The difference was is that I completely understand how I'm supposed to be attacking him in every game. I know exactly what my strategy is, whereas he wasn't clear on what it, he was trying, to, what his goal was. And many of those games, I think at least eight of them, ended with him having almost no permanence in play, even though we were 10, 12, 14, 15, 16 turns into the game. He had almost nothing in play anyway, despite the fact that I'm not playing with any mass land destruction. I'm all destroying things one to one. And yet I would still, although I think I had a copy or two of Dust to Dust in my deck because we were playing sideboard. But anyway, because of the snowballing interaction between early mana destruction backed up by card drawing artifacts and occasionally mind twist, you're able to cripple your opponent's mana early and then lock in that card, lock in that advantage using a mana artifact that they can no longer interact with because you either can protect it with counter magic or you've removed their white mana via counter magic to destroy Pearl and Lotus and so on, or you've stripped away all their white and regrown strip mines and kept them off a particular color. Without four strip mines, you don't have the ability, that's not even a game plan, because you can't reliably do that, and your opponent just has free reign to do whatever they want, coupled with the fact that you don't have mana drain to punish their proactivity. The, two, the sum of those two things is that you're playing just a completely different version of the game than what we played back in the day. And I think that the format is cheapened and diminished a lot by that restriction. On top of that, if you're playing the Swedish rules and you have only a single strip... Yeah, let's assume that we yeah. take the three, what would you put in? If these, if these three, well, I mean, hell, I'd probably play Mishra's Factories because there's... We really have to, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, maybe I'd play even more colored mana, but if you take these three strip mines out of the equation, this card becomes a ridiculous, oppressive problem. God pro like a god card. It's absurd. Yeah. It's absolutely absurd. If you think about the number of games that you lose to Library of Alexander when you have a set of four strip mines in your deck, yeah, that happens all the time anyway. Imagine when you have one out in your yeah, entire deck. Yeah, I don't think I've ever won a game. I mean, maybe if I was playing a combo deck and I got really lucky, but that's about yeah, it. It's unwinnable. And it's it, whenever unwinnable, the, yeah. and most of the decks are super slow and mid-rangey, so 
if your opponent leads with turn one library and you don't have a strip mine, just concede the game on the spot. You're not going to win. You'll probably win maybe four or five percent of the games, maybe. And that's if you play perfectly. They can do whatever the hell they want. They're drawing two cards a turn for no cost. How the hell is that's not beatable at all? Right. So there's no reason for that problem to exist. If you if you take three strip mines away, you've got the format, you've got control decks, you've got a lot of the skill, and you make this stupid card, which is already dumb to begin with, you make it absurdly oppressive. And you just counterfeit a sizable portion of games where one person gets a library and the other person just watches them kill them with it without having any ability to interact with it at all. And so I think that for that reason, and I guess the Swedish guys have put stone rains into their deck, a couple stone rains maybe, one or two. Yeah. It's not enough though. Because Stone Ring costs three mana, you don't always have fast mana, and by the time that you Stone Ring the library, even if the guy doesn't have a counter spell, it's already killed you anyway. It's already drawn into three cards for free. Right. And you had to tap out on turn three to cast a stupid sorcery. It's just ridiculous. You guys, something very interesting. We were walking to dinner, um, and Brian asked me the question, Daniel, what do you think makes a control deck a control deck? What are the most important cards? And I, I actually said the Jadum Tomb and the Disrupting Scepter, I thought those were the most controlling cards but Brian why don't you tell us I mean you, you mentioned one of them right one of them was strip mine yeah I mean I think this is I know that Stephen Menendian is really fond of the card Gush for example and he's written an entire <laughs> master's thesis about it or something right I think that I could do a similar thing about strip mine and about what it represents as a tool for control decks as a way of of containing an opponent and I'll try to I'll try to give you the TLDR about this to yeah. avoid being too long-winded about it. But what I told Daniel was that the, the most important cards, the eight most important cards in this entire deck, not even accounting for cards like Ancestral Recall and Brain Geyser and so on and Jam Day Tomes and the cards that people think really define what this deck is about. I don't even counterspell, guys. It's these four and these four. It's four strip mines and four disenchants. Disenchants and, and strip mine. Strip mine. Those wow. form the foundation of how control decks actually win and how they beat other decks in this format. Everything else aside, the strip mines and the disenchants allow all the other tools in the deck to actually work and function. And I'll talk about this, I'm sure, in a later in a later video. If I delve it's, into it's, 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 it's crazy though because now people in old school in the Swedish rules say that factories is what keeps it. Like factories are a, 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 like a like a I wouldn't say control, but I would say factories are. A, well, a viewed, pillar for the yeah, old school magic. I know that they're viewed as sort of a defining characteristic yeah. of the format, and that's it's artificial also because, of course, they're playing an environment with only through, with only one strip mine. But that aside, even if you only have one strip mine as a tool, every deck's disenchant you know, every deck is, is, is four killer. swords and four disenchants and lightning bolts, as well as things like moat and other creatures to block them with, as well as of course their own factories. But I think what's going on in their environment is just a little bit of groupthink. Right. When I played again, this guy that I played in New Zealand, when he and I rematched recently, he did not have factories in his deck. When we played before, he did, and he was at a much larger disadvantage against me when we played the first time because of his four factories. The oh, he was I, playing four factories. He was playing a four factory version because ah. that, was, that was the orthodoxy of the format. Everyone says, "Oh, you got to play with four mistress factories," right? and They're, not four strip mites. Right. Well, we were playing four strips and four factories. Okay. Because we were playing. Um, we were playing the right, eternal right. eternal weekend rules. Central, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can play four factories and four strip mines. And how are you how are you gonna run a mana base in a deck without putting thirty four land into it? It's not gonna work. Right. Right? You're gonna have to make something's gonna have to give, you're gonna have to make concessions. Plus it just made it so he got absolutely routed by Blood Moon. No answer to it at all because you can't fit basic land into a mana base that has eight colorless lands in it. It's impossible. Right. I mean, maybe, I think he had one island in his deck, but that's, like I said before, it's no answer. So, anyway, the factories are another thing entirely, and I can... Yeah, yeah, of course. Them. All right, guys, so thanks, Brian, thanks again for your time for the main deck. Guys, I appreciate your guys' patience. We've had several videos already, um, and if you guys go back to the bottom, there will be links to all the videos for this series. Uh, examining the deck, I might, I have to title this correctly, but... Brian does an amazing job, obviously coming from the guy who created the idea of card advantage and the way people changed the perspective of magic. It was a, a huge, a new phenomenon. It's, it's very historical. And Brian's been kind enough to share with everyone his take. And, and, and guys, next video will be about the sideboard. Uh, you do not want to miss out. Oh, I see a little guy with you know, a little red thing. So you guys be sure to watch the next video. We appreciate everything. Brian, thanks again. Sure thing.